It was in the spring, the early spring, that the people of the great city of Eleutheri gathered together to listen to the counsel given by the elders of the city. Now, Eleutheri had long sat in disputed territory. To the one side of them, the might of the Attican army. To the other side, the might of the Boeotian army. And for year upon year upon year, the armies of Boeotia and the armies of Attica had clashed and fought and battled and feuded as to who would own the city of Eleutheri. And of course, as kings and queens and politicians the world over have a want to do, none of them at any point in their clashings and their feudings had bothered to ask the people of Eleutheri themselves what they wanted. And so this was a, a first gathering for those people to sit and debate and decide. And after much discussion and the weighing up of options either side, they came down on the decision to go with the people of Boeotia and to declare themselves part of that territory. But they knew, of course, that in any such decision, whichever direction it had gone in, there would be on costs from the other side who would not be best pleased. They knew too that not only would the people of Attica be displeased, but the people of Athens themselves would be displeased with this decision. And the Athenians held great might, great weight throughout the many city-states of Greece. And so the people of Eleutheri decided that they would present a gift to the people of Athens. And they sent a delegation of big burly men carrying the gift and of diplomats and wise and tactful men to present the gift and to make it clear that this was by way of a peace offering to assuage any ill feelings over their decision to go with the Boeotians. And at the gates of Athens they arrived bearing upon a great palisade carried on the shoulders of the big burly men the gift to give to the people of Athens. The gates were opened, a delegation of the Athenian wisest elders and counsellors and archons came to greet this diplomatic party and they looked the gift up and down, up and down, and left to right, and circled around and around it, and at length they said, no thank you, it's, it's really not in keeping with the general decor of Athens, for you see, the Athenians prided themselves on their urbanity, upon their civility, upon their sophistication, upon their impeccable taste, and this gift presented by these strange, peculiar, backhill people of Eleuthere was a, a statue, a wooden statue, an old, roughly carved, roughly hewn wooden statue, depicting, of all the things, the god Dionysus, god of wine and women and song, God of debauchery, God of lustful gropings in darkened alleyways, God of mischievous goings on, a God beloved of the common man of the rustic backwoods, not a God beloved of noble and sophisticated and educated Athenians. And so with platitudes and reassurances that they had not taken the political decision to side with Boeotia ill, they, they nonetheless declined the gift of this rather rude and crude statue of Dionysus. Where, after all, could they possibly put such a thing? For there was no temple of Dionysus within the bounds of Athens. And the delegation from Eleutheri, well, what, what could they do? They, they felt embarrassed to go home, bearing the gift that had been so rudely refused. 
And they could hardly just sit on the doorstep of Athens day after day, week after week, waiting for them to change their mind. But the, the wise councillors of the delegatory party decided that they should journey downhill a little way. So they were not too, too encroached upon the city gates of Athens and make camp there. After all, they, they needed to rest after their long journey. They, they could break bread. They could take time to decide and discuss what to do and to keep their beloved statue of their most wondrous deity with them and treat it with the respect that the Athenians had failed to show it. Now, whilst down below on earth, the people of Eleuthere were whining and dining and relaxing and rubbing ointment into their sore feet after their long journey. Up in Olympus, uh, Dionysus himself had watched and noted this rude and crude, this ill treatment of his own likeness, his own image. And the gods, not even those gods of recent vintage, for Dionysus had not so very long ago left the earth in his human guise and ascended to the Olympic heights. Even such new gods are as readily offended and vengeful as the ancient gods of the old earth are. Dionysus was not to be slighted. And so he journeyed down to earth. He journeyed down to the gates of Athens and walked straight through them. He walked the perimeter of the Athenian wall, and where he went, curses fell within the footprints left, until he had circled the entire city and departed the way he had come and ascended back up to the Olympic Heights. And that very day, the men of Athens, for it was the men of Athens who had come to the city gates to turn away these strange rustics with their gifts, they, they well, they didn't notice at first, but they, they began to get a bit of a bit of an itch, a bit of a strange itch, and it, it was a hot climate, and, and the occasional itch, the occasional sweaty rash, well, it was not uncommon. Just required one to change one's undergarments rather more frequently than usual. But as the men went about their business, they started to notice that every other man they walked past in the streets was hmm, having a little bit of an itch, a bit of a scratch, a, a bit of a squirm. And as the hours of the day rolled on into night, and uh, the temperature dropped and became cooler and normally these heat rashes when it becomes cooler have a tendency to subside in actuality that the, the rash or whatever it may have been got worse and worse and itchier and itchier and they were squirming and they were scratching themselves raw in the most intimate of places and by morning they had a rash spread all over and it was not merely itchy it was burning it, it felt like somebody had set light to their nether regions and that the, the, the rash began to well not to be too indelicate it began to, to swell uh, and that the the red blotches grew pussy they began to leak and well i won't attempt to describe the smell to you but it was most desperately unsanitary and whilst the occasional sailor coming back from their adventures in, in far-flung ports would occasionally bring back some unfortunate memento of their adventures in far-flung ports, for every man of Athens, high-born and low-born and middle-born, to have exactly the same condition as each other was, was unknown. I mean, Occasionally they did get up to things with each other, but not to this extent. And clearly the, the wise men, the physicians, the elders of the city rapidly realised this was no mere unfortunate heat trash. This was no mere sordid legacy of a sailor's adventures. This was 
a curse, a curse upon the men of Athens. Three days rolled past, and the, the burning, the itching, the scratching, the, the rancorous leakaging, oh, it, oh, well, that, that's, let's not go further into the details, and the details do get worse. But by the end of the third day, the, the sages of the city, the priests and the philosophers, had cast their auguries, had looked at the flight of birds, had consulted with each other, and as a, a man, the wise ones of the city said, yes, this is a curse of the gods, or more specifically, of one god, for we have grievously offended one particular god. The very day that this rash started, we turned away from our city gates the gift of Dionysus. And what better way for a, a god of, of wine and women and song, of, of raucous, uproarious living, to make his displeasure known than unfortunate goings on down below? And as a man, the entire male population of Athens, led by the very delegation that had shut the gates on the people of Eleuthere, made the trip downhill, for they knew perfectly well from passing travellers coming and going that the men of Eleuthere were camped out, resting their sore feet and, and whining and dining half a mile downhill from Athens. They made that journey an itchy, slightly limping, slightly awkward, slightly pungent journey down to the encampment and presented their apologies and said if the people of Eleutheria were still willing, they would welcome the statue of Dionysus with open arms. And whilst they did not have a temple to put it in yet, they would bloody well go and build one. And all of the men of the city would contribute to the financing of it, and those possessed of the necessary skills would contribute to the building of it. And so the delegation from Eleuthere rejoiced and said, of course, they were more than happy to make a second offering of the gift that had been turned down first time. And they journeyed up to the city, carrying the statue upon the shoulders of those big burly men, and they welcomed it into the city and temporarily placed it into one of the great temples of the city until an appropriate shrine for Dionysus himself could be built, and it was built post-haste. And the very next year, and that is a remarkably short time for the building of a temple, well, the passage of 12 months, the very next year that temple to Dionysus was open and ready for devotees to come and burn incense and pour libations of wine and, and make their offerings and their prayers before the altars and before the prized statue that was the gift of this distant city-state. And whatever displeasures may have been felt amongst the politicians of Athens at the political alliances formed by the people of Eleuthere, well, they knew better than to irritate Dionysus any more than they already had done. And it is to be thanked, and was thanked, that on the very evening of the day in which the statue of Dionysus was placed within the city, not one man scratched his nether regions more than absolutely necessary. The swellings began to go down. And over the course of the next three days, the itching subsided, the separating dried up, the, the medical problems experienced by the men of the city ceased, such that by the third day, not even the sailors who had brought in their own conditions, which we won't go over, even they had been cured of conditions which they'd already had before they even arrived in the city. The men of Athens were content. And Dionysus, up there in Olympus, was content. And to demonstrate the ongoing nature of their gratitude. The priests who had been appointed to serve in the Temple of Dionysus suggested that for the great opening the next spring they should mark it with a great festival, a festival of thanksgiving. And so the Dionysia was instituted in Athens. The, the giving of gratitude and part of the Dionysia was the carrying of the great phalloi, 
the great images of male nether regions which were carted around the city in thanksgiving for the curing of that rather unfortunate condition. And to further celebrate, for as well as being the god of wine and women and song, Dionysus is also the god of performance, of musicians and storytellers and poets, and anyone who might get up and entertain the crowds by which soever means appeal to them. So as part of the great celebrations at the site of the place of worship of Dionysus himself, with that ancient wooden statue looking down upon the very stage itself, a great stage was built. And the, the, the gifted of Athens were invited, and the gifted of further afield were invited to come and to sing and to dance and to cavort and to do turns and to entertain the crowds who had so raucously cheered on the parades of the giant phalloi and swigged their wine in honour of Dionysus and on to the stage alongside the musicians and the singers and the jugglers and the acrobats and the storytellers and the performers of one sort or another there strode a famed poet the poet Thespis there he came having had but three nights before he was due to take his turn upon the stage at this the very first celebration of Dionysus within the walls of Athens he had had a dream and it must be said he had also had quite a lot of vino as well he had been imbibing the liquid essence of Dionysus and so he attributed the dream to Dionysus as to quite what he should do upon the stage and for the intervening three days and three nights he had been scribbling non-stop poetry he had been writing dithyrambic poetry like no one's business churning out scroll after scroll after scroll until there were a dozen yards of scrolls more than even hermione granger could have dreamt of in her most assiduous homework sessions he had filled a great length of scrolls with a poem, a long, ongoing poem, not like any other poem he had written, or indeed that anybody else had written. And when he came onto stage, he came with two servants who brought a great basket and laid it before him. The audience who had gathered in the, the auditorium fell to silence. The drums were beaten, the trumpets were blown to signal the start of this performance. Thespis himself began to read from his scrolls, began to declaim his poetry, and it was a poem about the life of, well, who else could it be but the life of, except Dionysus himself, and more specifically than the life of Dionysus, it was the tale of the death of Dionysus, the, the sorrow and the sadness and the weeping caused. and. One by one, he took turns to become the characters in the tale of the, 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 the twilight years of Dionysus of his arrival at his own deathbed. And as he became each character, one of the servants would take a mask from the basket and present it to him, and he would don the mask and declaim in his best theatrical voice, my dear, he would declaim as the character he had become. Turn after turn after turn he took. The audience were agog. They had heard poetry before, of course they had, but they'd never seen anyone performing the characters, donning masks, wrapping himself in cloaks and in hoods, and soldiers, spears and swords, and costume after costume. Never had they seen such a thing, with the servants scurrying around, putting on costumes for him and taking them off again as he moved on to the next character, until by the end of it, when he finished the final line of the dithyrambic poem, poetry and took his bow before the audience they were up on their feet they were cheering and clapping and whooping him on they lapped it up and it became the very first theatrical performance and thespis of course gave his name to the entire profession of acting of the thespians for he had invented not simply poetry, not simply storytelling, which had existed since the dawn of time. He had fused poetry and storytelling into one and created theatre. And from that day, 
until the day when the last theatrical performance took place many, many centuries later in the Temple of Dionysus. Each year they honoured the god of wine and women and song with performances, both tragedies and comedies. And even when the temple was closed, the devotions to Dionysus did not cease, have not ceased, continue to this very day. And theatricals the world over continue to imbibe in the essences of Dionysus, many of them, and they continue to honour his name as the originator of theatre.